I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Will Simpson, a fractional chief operating officer with 25 years experience, the last five in a fractional capacity. Will focuses on working with product companies between five and 250 million in revenue with less than 1,500 employees. He's based in Austin, Texas. Welcome, Will. Thanks, Jay. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. We work with fractional executives to recreate their corporate income without the insane hours, building the business they want on their own terms. Jay Kingley, the co-founder and CEO of Maven, shares best practices along with tips and tricks on how you can build a robust pipeline to become fully booked with clients, start getting paid what you're worth, and eliminate your brute force marketing. Enjoy today's episode. So let's get into it. Well, I am the CEO of a $100 million products company. We've been growing rapidly, but now I feel like I'm stalled out and I'm not sure why. We bump into each other for the first time at a business conference. You've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Go. Still happy? Still going good? Rocking and rolling? (laughs) Well, you know how it is. We, uh, we always have our challenges, but we keep fighting the good fight. You know, when you have those challenges, sometimes you feel stuck. Have you ever had that feeling of feeling stuck? You ever feel like that? Well, sometimes I feel like I can't imagine what it would be to be unstuck. <laughs> Jay, that's, that's what my clients tell me all the time. It's like, I started this business to do what I love, not to be stuck and go around in circles. Let's enjoy the conference and walk around. But if you'd like to have a good conversation, let's, let's grab a coffee or a beer. See what it is that maybe can get you some joy back, get you past that stuck, get out of that, that rut, if you will. I can, uh, I can certainly, I can certainly listen to some of the, some of the issues that you're having that I may have heard somewhere else. And maybe we can come up with a plan for you. Always like breaking bread with someone right. who knows what they're talking about. Well, uh, so I will hit you up for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. Let me shift a little bit. Why do your clients need what you do? Well, they need they need what I what I do when they can't do it themselves. That's the shortest answer, and that may seem overly simplistic, but it's not. We do our best work when we're when we surround ourselves with others that can bring a different perspective. That's what I do. That's why my clients need me. They need me to bring with full candor those other viewpoints, the things that do get you unstuck, the things that make you come out of your comfort zone. And it's not always easy or automatic. So that's why they need me. So, well, you know, there's a lot of functions in any business. We've got sales, we've got marketing, we've got operations, finance, technology, IT, HR, and I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch. Which one of those are you going to help me with? I'm going to bring it down to just three and we're going to talk about sales. And we're going to talk mm-hmm. about operations. We're going to talk about finance. And I can play in two out of three. I play well in operations. That is my strongest area. But in the size of companies that I like to deal with, I also very, very versed in, in finance. And they tend to go hand in hand. Sales is the receiver of the benefits of what operations and finance can deliver so that they can go out and do the job that they do, which is sell the thing. So when you really think it's simple, we sell a thing, we move money around for a thing. We build and deliver a thing. Those are your three areas. I help in moving money around and building and delivery. So let's take the, what you typically lead with your core strength, which is operations. Yes. And I, I love, by the way, how you tied that into finance and sales, because at the end of the day, that's the P&L for the business, isn't it? It is. So uh, a great way to look at it. But let's, let's start with operations. So what do you see are the big issues that are causing companies to get stuck. To put it very bluntly, and a way that not a lot of people like to hear sometimes, operations is boring. <laughs> it's not <laughs> fun. I'm the wet blanket. I bring the. I, I I enjoy the wet blanket, and so that's the reason it gets ignored because it isn't fun. It isn't. Ooh, the new widget. It isn't. Look, we hit our revenue numbers. It isn't. Wow, finance just did this, this, and the other, and we saved this. It's not sexy. It doesn't make the street happy. It doesn't make the investors happy. 
but it does make your employees happy. It does make them engage. It is the boring inner workings that make everything else good. And so that's, but it gets ignored because it's boring. I mean, that's, that's what it is. I love it, but I'm, I'm a weirdo. So I, I love, I love internal things. I resemble that uh, comment. Well, I uh, have never enjoyed doing operations. I spent a long time, many, many moons ago, looking for a partner who does. And I, I found her. Uh, Talk about you, Taz. And uh, okay, don't tell her that. But I probably have called her a weirdo once or twice <laughs> because she is so focused and great at the operational side of business. So I, I resonate completely with what you're saying. Let's go to the other side of, if you will, those issues and pains. So when you come in and you get rid of those things, what are the outcomes that your clients can expect when they work with you? So the outcomes that, that, that you can expect is that those boring things that were causing issues become invisible. As silly as that might sound, that's what you want. You don't want to hear from IT and compliance and, and, and you, it's like, what, what, what do you mean our, our sprints running long? No one wants to hear that. Everybody wants to hear, Hey, here's your widget. It's ready. It's, it's working well. The outcome that you get is scalability. That's the things that we can talk about. The outcome you get is predictability. Those are things that we can talk about. You can indirectly draw the line straight up to revenue. About If we're not talking about revenue, if we're not talking about growing and building the business, you're not focusing on the right things. But when you talk about, hey, we have happier employees that you're not hearing from, they become not a pain point, that resembles more revenue at the same time. So that's what you get. Those are the outcomes. And those are very, very top level business outcomes. A lot of times working with my clients, I do break it down more specific, but there's no way to do that until you get into the business. When I have the, the good fortune to speak to someone like yourself, who's got a lot of expertise, a lot of insight, perhaps even a little wisdom to sprinkle on top. One of my favorite questions is, what do you know that your clients don't know but should. I would say that my clients don't know that people matter more than the product. We will never change the world without a visionary. This is a positive statement about a visionary, not a negative. Well, visionaries see their thing, their widget, their service as the thing that's going to save the world, and they're right. And they can sometimes not realize that it's actually the people that are more important. So that's, that's the thing I would bring. I would drive it. That is a yin and a yang. That is a balance. It isn't an either or. It's an and. That's what they need to know. It's your product and your people. You're delivering both. And if you don't think about it that way, you're missing out. You're losing a competitive advantage that you should have. So that would be the first thing. And then the second thing that it, that, that's a corollary to it, and none of this like this, including the, the wet blanket, it's always going to take longer than you think. We're delivering software usually um, or a product's. I'm not a surgeon. Uh, uh, lives aren't literally in the balance. Uh, um, um, I mean, we're delivering software. If it's two weeks late, nobody's really going to die because that little widget didn't turn green. So we need to sometimes be very aware of the fact that we're not sacrificing people at the altar of timeline. So those are the things that I would that I would bring. When, you're, when you engage me, you're not engaging me to hear a, 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 an echo chamber. When you talk about the, the visionary, there were there were two thoughts that came into my mind, you know, that old saying, it takes a village. You, you can't do it on your own. No. And, and, and the other thing is people who win, you know, if you're that visionary and you do want to change the world, you recognize that you need a team. And the way you build that team is you play to strengths and have other members on the team cover the weaknesses. So a visionary is bringing that to the table. What Agreed. they're not going to bring, almost by definition, is that day-to-day -day focus on operations, on all the little things that allows the company to actually deliver on the vision that that founder had. And I, and I think you articulated that incredibly well. Very insightful. I do want to add, it, it, it's also important to note that people like me who do 
work on the complementary side. We will never change the world. We will never bring the idea. So it's important for people sitting in this role to understand I am nothing without my partner visionary. For that reason, it needs to be a good match. Well, that's the whole point of team. You're nothing without the visionary, but the hard truth is the visionary is not going to be anything without you, too. It does take that team carefully constructed, everybody playing to strengths. But when you look at the whole, it wins. So that brings me to wanting to understand there's a lot of fractional COOs that are out there, more every day. So if I think about all those fractional COOs who want to serve your target market, what is it that differentiates you? What is it that sets you apart from everyone else? One thing that sets me apart is the career path by which I took, which means that includes all of the the lessons that I learned. Lessons means failures. I came through a technologist path. Typically, a technologist path ends up at CTO, maybe, or high-functioning advisor, but usually doesn't transfer into COO, which really has to look at the holistic business. It usually doesn't end that path. I ended up there. I became enamored with solving the business problem over solving the code problem. But it gave me a very unique experience of the delivery. This isn't the industrial age anymore. This is the information age. We deliver things electronically. We're not putting nuts and bolts together anymore. So my experience in delivering and building the very foundation of the things that we are now as companies putting out into the world gives me a unique perspective relative to most COOs. Most COOs came down the sales path. It's a noble path. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just different. Some came from the finance path, even though not as common. It's not the same as coming through the delivery path. So when I talk about understanding and making our employees feel like they're part of the mission, I'm saying it from a place of experience. I was that employee didn't quite feel like they were part of the mission or when it was working well, I did. And so that's what I bring. I bring to the table a different perspective than a typical COO that went through the sales path, which is the most common path. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit more about Will. And if I could foreshadow here, it might actually include a little bit of Will's failure, not just his success. See you in a minute. As a fractional executive, you work with us to help you recreate your corporate income without working the insane hours. Our fractional flywheel service focuses on how to price, package, and position your years of experience and expertise, create and refine your go-to-market strategy so it's effective and efficient, and then nail your execution. Working with us, you will build a robust pipeline to become fully booked, start getting paid what you're worth, and eliminate your brute force marketing. Maven's unique fractional catalyst service for those serving startups and early stage companies gets you acting like a venture capitalist in managing your business and as an entrepreneur when working with your clients. Achieve financial security and reward with clients who want you to take charge, ask for forgiveness, not permission, in an environment without all the politics and bureaucracy you find in corporate. Email j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com to learn more. Welcome back. We're talking to Will Simpson, a fractional chief operating officer serving products companies between five and 250 million in revenue. Will, let's find out a bit more about you. Let's start with what's your biggest professional accomplishment? You know, my biggest professional accomplishment is from a people perspective, I learned that reaching across the aisle and listening to people that weren't like me in my professional career was more valuable than I could have ever imagined. I was at Dun & Pratt, and this has been a while, but I reached across the aisle to a marketing group to help me with a compliance issue, right? So you can see oil and water here, not mixing. This is technical stuff. From my perspective at the time, the smoke and mirrors of marketing. But I was mandated by the company to execute this compliance program and not lose more than $750,000 in, 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 in annual recurring revenue. Don't do it. Well, that's, that's, that's the ceiling. No more. But I reached out and worked with marketing 
and their team and learn things and listen to the way that we positioned and messaged things. It was the same thing. But in the next year, we actually increased recurring revenue by just shy of $1 million. So not losing, we won. So it was, it was great fun. You know, it's always fun when everybody thinks you're the hero. When you, you, when the tech guy has salespeople liking him, you know, it's, it's one of those things. But, but the real, but the real win there was that I learned that you can partner and make and, and do better. So that was my first experience to really reach out to someone that I've not even a common language had to develop a common language. Speaking marketing wasn't my, in my language at that time. So I consider that my, my earliest win. It may or may not have been my best. There's probably some more dollar wins out there I had. There's some team wins, but that was it. So that's the one you're going to hear about. Before the break, Will, you, you mentioned the failure word. And like any good attorney in the courtroom, I'm going to say you opened the door to I my did. next question. I did. What's your biggest professional failure? But more importantly, what did you learn from it? And how did it shape what you do today? Failure can be summed up in one word, and that word's hubris. And, and, and is, it's the antithesis of what I just spoke about in, in my success is that I, I humbled myself a little bit and went and talked to the lowly marketing people. From my perspective at the time, and this event was one where I decided I had all the answers. And that should always be a red flag to us. When we have all the answers, if you're talking to someone who says, oh, I've got all the answers, I've thought of everything, walk away. Um, I didn't walk away. I doubled down. I I had just come through a good win of enabling a team. We had done a, a, a unique exercise in, in, in a reorg. Um, we did a self-reorganization. It worked great. Had a very engaged team. And so I kept doubling down on making leadership fluid from the team perspective. And I untethered them from product accountabilities. Un without thinking about the ramifications of what would happen with doing that. And so now i got all these teams going off on their own. And while that was bad and we missed some dates and I had to go and scramble and pull things back in, and I got my CEO going, dude, what's up? This was going, what did you do? And having to own that I did it, I lost part of the team. That was the hardest lesson, the, that, that I, failed, I failed the team because I took away their winning bar. If you don't say, when we clear this, we win and make it all ambiguity, how do you know? I'm over here going, I'm doing this great thing. And I'm smarter than everybody in the room. And boom, well, I lost one of, my, one of my best leaders through that experience because the trust was just broken and it's terrible. Um, thankfully, that person has, with Grace and I, we talked today, but, but through, that was a bad experience. And so uh, it is a cautionary tale of hubris. And when you hear your brain telling you that you know everything, you need to go find a mirror, take a breath and say, no, you're full of crap. Talk to the people that you know you should be talking to because you put them around you to start with. And so that was, that was probably my biggest, my biggest failure. And it, and it was very, and it was very expensive. It cost us. It cost the company. It cost lots of things. I, I didn't lose my job. Um, but it, I certainly could have. Let's talk for a sec about your current business. What would you say are your biggest challenges in building your fractional COO business? Well, it's my, it's my weakness. It's why, frankly, Jay, it's why I'm talking to people like you. It's why I'm a member of a community like the Fractional Executive. FEC has people that fix my weakness, which is sales. When you look at those three buckets that I talked about earlier, I got two out of three. What I don't have is sales. So that's where lead gen comes from. So I'm very, very singularly reliant on referrals in my own network, which is nice. I have a big network. I'm old. So I've built one. That's not the thing, but it's also not predictable. First thing I tell the client when we're talking about this, oh, I'm stuck. It's like, well, what'd you predict you're going to do? What do you mean predict? Well, I'm not predictable. I'm not eating my own dog food. So my weakness is, is, in, is on the sales side. It's sales and lead gen. What, you know, again, that's why I'm here. If misery loves company, there's a lot of misery. Uh, among a lot of fractionals who share that challenge. So let me flip it around. What advice would you give to other fractional executives? The advice that I give all fractional executives and solopreneurs of any kind, know that you don't have all of the answers. If you're in sales and you have leads and all those things, that's great. Do you know how to close them? Do you know how to execute on them? 
Do you know how to run those three pieces of the business that I'm talking about as a solopreneur? Because you still have to do it. You Maybe you partner with one of your fellow fractionals. Then the other thing is runway. Get your pencil out. Get your finances hat on. How long can I go without a paycheck? You need to have that math written down somewhere. It's not fun math. No one wants to do it. Your spouse or your partner isn't going to want to hear it. But you are risking and you need to know how far you have to go. And when you need to pull up and go, okay, this isn't working. Or, you know what, maybe I'll go over here and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do DoorDash for a while. Whatever it is you need to do, you need to understand what your runway is. So it's a lesson I learned a long, long time ago, unknowingly, um, called Managing a Bankroll. So um, I've recently written a book um, of, about my time uh, when I was a poker player. I learned a lot of lessons playing poker for 12 years. This isn't a 15-minute gig. This was my job. And if you ever ran out of money, you simply couldn't come to the table anymore. Well, it's the same concept. If you can't afford to spend a little bit on marketing or a little bit on that LinkedIn extra thing or whatever it is that you need to do, keeping your domain name, if you don't have the bankroll to sustain you in those lean times, you can't even come to the table anymore. So it's the same. It is the same kind of lessons. It's where the name of the book came from. It, it's you've got to lose to win. So with all the things that we talked about today, it is exactly not kind of like it's exactly like running a business. You must run your solopreneur business the way that you're giving advice to everybody to run their hundred million dollar business. Every business that you want to start, no matter what type, takes capital. Yep. The good news is starting a fractional business is on the lower end of capital requirements. But lower end does not mean zero. Yep. So that is very sage advice, Will. So you, you, you brought up poker, which uh, stimulates my next question to you. Uh, what happened in your life, personally or professionally, that most explains why you're doing what you do today? I don't know that I'd have been able to answer that question correctly 18 months ago. But today, what I would tell you is, is that my experience playing poker and running poker games. I was an entrepreneur and didn't know it. I, it, I didn't make money holding the hand and playing the poker. I made money collecting rake, just like Vegas does. I also played. But learning to look at the big picture of being a solopreneur poker player, there's a marketing aspect. I had to round up players that I knew wanted my services, that wanted to be at the table and could afford to be at the table. That's marketing. That is branding. That is whether I realized it or not. Finance, we just talked about that. Very, very important. It's very, very outsized important when you're a solopreneur because it prevents you from even showing up at the table. And then delivering. You have to become a master of the craft. Whatever it is, my widget happened to be providing a good experience so that other players would want to come back over and over so that they came in and got real food, not cheap Domino's pizza. I had a real waitress that would come and serve stolies, not rot gut vodka. So knowing, knowing those things and looking and building the experience, I was selling an experience. I didn't look at it like that. I was hustling poker. But taking all of those things absolutely play into looking at a business holistically from a COO perspective, from the inside. That is absolutely formed who I am today. There's no way around it. I love how you were able to take being a professional poker player and actually learn some life lessons, some business lessons, which form a foundation for what it is that you do today. So what's next for you over the coming 12 months? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing my practice. I, I have clients. Um, I am also going to um, pivot a little bit. I, I, I did recently write a book. I mentioned it. Um, it's a fictionalized version of my time when I was there. Um, I'm going to explore that a little bit. I'm, I'm currently writing my second book. My website's going to go live pretty soon. And I'm going to see what it's like to write. I, I who knew that someone as wet blanket as me would enjoy writing? I have no writing skills, but I'm a good storyteller. So I'm going to play with that a little bit. Side gig is the name of the game today. That's my new side gig. 
So I'm sure we've got people in our audience that are very intrigued about you and what you can do for them. What is the best way for our audience to contact you? Absolutely. Email is always the best way. Hello, I'm on the cusp of being a boomer. Um, so I use email. It's will.simpson at 101112.com. And that's all spelled out. I'll give you a little tidbit. The way to remember 101112.com is that it was my wife and mine's first date, which was October 11th, 2012. So 101112.com, all spelled out. That's will.simpson. Um, you can also hit my website. There's contact forms you can fill out. There is a calendar link on my website. You can also set time with me instantly. And then, of course, LinkedIn. Um, it's linkedin.com slash IN, as is everyone's, Will R. Simpson. And there I am. You'll find me. We will put all of that in the show notes for both the podcast and the video. But Will, you have given a incredibly valuable piece of advice to all the married men out there who are responsible for remembering dates which most of us are genetically incapable for doing it, set up your domain name to be the date. And then when your spouse says, do you remember our first date? You just have to think about your web address. That's it. Love it. <laughs> okay, Will, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcast and all the major platforms. In our, and on our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned. Mm-hmm.